Welcome back to the Rex Reviews Podcast. It's Lou McCoy, Casey Day, and Taborosaurus Rex broadcasting today from Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, where winter has officially set in, and it's beautiful out there. It really is a special time of year. To continue our discussion today in this portion of the show, we usually reference a lot of Second Amendment features, and this is the guns discussion of the Rex Reviews podcast. Over the course of the Sniper 101 series, Rex, you have put a lot of information on the internet. Yeah, it was only supposed to be 10 parts, but it ended up being 101 parts. And actually, this discussion will constitute the last part of the Rex Reviews Sniper 101 communications. Because part 101 on the YouTube is coming up soon, isn't it? It is. This is actually going to be that part. Oh, this is it. We're making it. This is it. We're making it in this podcast, actually. So the people in the podcast get the sneak preview. You know, we cover a lot of information in Sniper 101. And if you look at the playlist, we go over everything. We communicated a lot of stuff in the series. Years and years of content at work there, Rex. But we neglected to tell you... The most important thing of all, which is what we're going to discuss in this discussion here. Today is the final class of Sniper 101. It is. The final, if you will. The final and the most important part. So over time, if you look over history, and this is super important, I hope this one really absorbs and I hope this one gets the most views, but it won't because people like watching stuff explode and they'll click on the silly videos and have the extremely huge earth moving like world-changing videos. They'll never click on those, but the loyal viewers will dig this. So after years and years of studying Sniper 101, it all accumulates to this. Today's discussion, today's final course, and what is the most important lesson to take away from this whole course, Mr. Rex? We need to learn how to think strategically rather than tactically. Strategic thinking. Strategic thinking. Because as a person who is striving to gain warrior skills, which is what most people are probably doing when they're watching this video collection, uh, they want to learn to uh, be better equipped to maybe win a fight if they ever have to get into a fight, right? And so when you're talking about the sniper craft, that's what folks are watching these videos for. If you consider history, dude, there's been a lot of really good warriors, really good sword fighters, really good archers really good generals, really good uh, kings and queens, right? Commanders and all these different things. But if you are fighting in a lost cause or in a battle that's simply in the huge equation of things, we need to learn which side we're fighting for and we need to anticipate the moves of how people will manipulate the situations. And if you look at today's current events and if you consider history, you can see a huge consistent pattern that is repeated over and over again. Oftentimes, we're tricked into getting into fights that we never should have started. And so we need to learn when not to pull the trigger. And there was a question Casey asked a couple podcasts ago. When do you, how do you know when to pull the trigger? And that is like the most difficult question to answer. But honestly, it's the most important one. Because you can win a gunfight, dude. You can win a battle and you can win a war. But it can be all for a lost cause or for something that is bad. Okay, so just winning is not always winning. And that's the thing that, you know, tactically thinking is how to win that battle, how to win that one fight, how to survive for the next five minutes, five days or five years. That's tactical thinking. But strategic thinking is long term. Is this actually going to make life better? Is this going to help mankind continue on its path in a good direction? And that's what we need to consider. And this takes probably the most study out of any of the fields. So you're, you're kind of a science guy. Um, you use scientific method a lot. If you were to put it in sort of a scientific method way of going about when to pull the trigger, what would your setup look like? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Here's, here's what we got to do. We, we don't have enough information to know where we're sitting strategically. In order to conduct any kind of experiment using scientific method and to make an intelligent decision on anything, 
we have to familiarize ourselves with all different kinds of situations. We have to do the proper research before we write the research paper and come to any kind of conclusion on any matter, right? There's always going to be an excuse to go and fight. There's always an excuse. There's always a cause to fight for. But are those things necessarily the right thing to do? Is it worth it? What's the cost benefit analysis? What were the results of when people tried similar things in the past? What did it end up happening, right? So you can look at examples, historically speaking, Roman times, you can look at the French Revolution. Were they fighting for a just cause? You bet, from their tactical position, they were, but they didn't think strategically enough to see how it might backfire. And there were positive effects that came off of things like that. I'm not saying it was a bad thing to have the French Revolution, but as you can see in history, sometimes these things throw you a curveball if you don't think around the corner enough. And you might win the next 10 minutes, but you create a hell situation for you for the next uh for your whole generation after you and uh, this might sound like preaching guys but i'm dead serious i mean you can look at pretty much a lot of the different uh conflicts that have happened over time and all these conflicts were totally avoidable and some of them maybe had a net positive change or a net negative change but that's what we have to consider is we have to really think around the corner and anticipate what's going to happen and uh, we can uh, talk about this, Lou, too, in terms of the social, and we're going to get around to this in a minute here, in the current context of where America sits and what the battle plan is. But the problem is, scientifically speaking, like Casey was asking about, in order to make any intelligent decision, we can't just imagine, like, from our little tiny perspective, what could happen. We have to familiarize ourselves with data from other people who have pounded the ground before us, who have tried these things. There's a lot of data. That's called history. And so if we're familiar with history and what makes people drive, We can make a smarter decision on, okay, how is this deal going to pan out? Is it going to suck or is it going to be awesome? Then you'll know. Just familiarizing yourself with the basic facts and the context. You can look at a really good way to go, actually, is to read firsthand historical accounts of events. And that only, I mean, you can read the writings of Julius Caesar. He wrote his stuff down. You don't need to read his historian's take on him necessarily by itself. You can read what his thoughts were in battle in Gaul and all over the world when he took over stuff and manipulated different local entities against each other to like accomplish his means. And a lot of that stuff crosses directly over. And then you don't even hardly need a filter because you're getting it straight from Caesar and understanding who that guy was and what his objective was to be king of the world. You kind of get a clear picture of what he's trying to accomplish. (laughs) You can read uh, in as much as you know, you probably get yelled out of the bookstore if you went and bought it, but you could read Mein Kampf. You could read what Adolf Hitler's perspective was, what his thoughts were, at least whoever wrote that book. And some people don't even think he wrote it. Uh, it was written by someone else probably. And he put his name on it, but it really communicates his philosophy. And you can read all the mistakes that idiot made and uh, what made that guy tick so that you can see, okay, if you input this data, what are the results? Holy crap, Europe burned down and he didn't accomplish anything and he died. Probably. Or maybe he's in Argentina when he retired in the 90s, he died. Who knows how it happened there. <laughs> it depends how much uh, down the rabbit hole you want to go. But yeah, you can read the firsthand accounts. I like autobiographies. I like when you're talking about the American Revolution. People have pens and papers, and they did invent language a long time ago. So a lot of times the history books try to digest this information for us. So it's good for us to familiarize ourselves from maybe firsthand witnesses, Civil War. You can read the, the journals of the generals and of uh, the different people, and you can kind of get a perspective of when you input this information, what happened. And here's the other thing too, in the modern context, a lot of people maybe are kind of in the naive category. And we think because we're ignorant of history and we don't know how people have manipulated stuff in the past, we don't think we can possibly ever be used. No one's ever going to use me. It's all pure intent. The media is not lying. Politicians will never lie. As exactly as reported on my television set that feeds me and spoon feeds me my little information. And they trick us into fighting each other because there are people to advantage from these things. So if there's anything in history that we should learn is that history repeats itself. And if we're ignorant of it, we will repeat it because we are really, really clueless and really stupid and very easily led down the wrong path. And the oldest tricks in the book continue to work. And they're an old trick because they continuously work. Every new generation forgets the trick. That's why it's an old one, because it still works, because they keep using it, see? And so if we familiarize ourselves with these things, we can bust through a lot of the BS and realize 
what's going down so that we can invest in the right side and be on the right side of history and maybe know when to escape and evade, when to engage, when to put your life on the line. There were times in history, in my opinion, that I'm very thankful people put their life on the line to defend an idea and to fight for something because it created an incredible, huge experiment in human history. You know, like I think the founding of this country actually was incredible. I mean, you look at the results and we live on the tail end of the empire now when uh, we're all so spoiled and rich that it just degenerates at this point. So we're not seeing a proper cross-section of all the fruits that it has bared over time because it's been corrupted now to a large degree. But I mean, there's other examples historically too of like what made these giant empires so successful? Like the Roman empire was catapulted to the forefront. Like it was a republic, man. Like it was a representative republic. I mean, American system was built on that too. So like what made it good, but then what made it crash at the end? See, it was really good and it just propelled itself. Absolute world power, most powerful empire of its time, right? So what happened there to make it good? You can read what happened and then you can read, okay, what the heck destroyed this? Who destroyed it? Why? What was the political motivation or was it just chaos or degeneration? And that's something we need to consider if we are going to be strategically thinking because... Once we possess these Warcraft skills, you have a responsibility to employ them for good. Otherwise, you're counterproductive to everything you learn to do with that rifle, right? Or whatever, or the sword or the bow. So just being a good soldier isn't necessarily advantageous to you or your country or to the earth. You know what I'm saying? Or your offspring or the the continuation of the human species. Because pretty much every army in history that destroyed itself, there was a lot of good soldiers in there and they had the tactics down and they had the craft down. But that's the reality of the earth, man, is like when you engage in something that heavy in a war or in a conflict or in a revolution, man, the consequences are heavy. And just because we watch Hollywood all day and we forgot what that actually means, we think it's going to unveil itself in a romantic fashion because we sit on the couch eating Cheetos. You're not going to be comfortable in an actual revolution. It's going to suck. So you better be very, very careful before we think about engaging. So strategic thinking is incredibly important. So we need to take our history into consideration here. And looking back at these firsthand accounts of whether it's Caesar or any of these guys, reading their accounts of it is a lot more telling than having the history books digested for us. I think so. Yep. And it's okay to have a certain degree of that, but as long as we're aware of it, you can read a history book where the guy digests it, but you got to be aware of who those people are, what organization, what schools pushing it. You know, there's a lot of propaganda. Propaganda is different than history, but propaganda can also reveal motivations of the people in the current history. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? So you can learn a lot by reading a modern history book and where they're trying to twist it. Just because the news is corrupt nowadays doesn't mean it's not going to be incredibly revealing of the current motives and the current pressure. So if the news is pushing everyone to have a certain feeling about a certain issue or a certain person, if that pressure is universally going in one direction, that gives a lot of clue on what the heck is going down. Like, why would they all push in this direction? What are they trying to do? Then you can back up. And if you're familiar with history, you maybe have a better chance, and it's not 100% guaranteed, to kind of anticipate what the heck's going to happen if stuff goes the way everyone's trying to think it might go. So with all that in mind, Mr. X, it begs the question, what about today? What about the engineered conflict that is out there? What about the sides that we are being forced to take? What about the media? What about the news and the directions that it's pushing our national consciousness or world consciousness for that matter? Yeah. All right. So we just went through like the most contentious political election in American history, probably in our generation for sure. There's been, and that's another thing, there's been pretty contentious situations in the past, obviously. But uh, this one is very, very interesting to watch unfold because there's so much heat and emotion and pressure involved. There's a lot at stake for both sides. And we have to discern what the heck's going on here to see, do we engage? Are both sides wrong? Is one side right? Are both sides right? I don't know. We have to check this out and really navigate very carefully if we want to make the right decision on that deal. What did you say earlier about emotion? Emotion is what fills in all the gaps of ignorance. When anyone's insecure in a topic, in just a general trend, it's not always true. But um, a lot of times you'll see that people who are insecure in a topic won't logically discuss it. It'll come out in an emotional rant, tirade, or fit. 
And so that's something to watch out for too. Just because someone's emotional about something doesn't mean that it was necessarily thought through properly, right? Because a lot of this stuff is like, we, we can parrot uh, what other people have tricked us into saying. And I think we're beating around a bush here a little bit. So we're going to zero in on it, but we're just exploring the periphery of the topic matter before we get into it. We got to plow the fields before we start getting into it a little too far other here. It is kind of a fixation situation. They are trying to get everyone focused. It's called misdirection. Yeah. You think about magicians, right? Why do they have that chick out there with the red dress and the sparkly butt? Right? <laughs> you ever notice that? I mean, while she's over there like, oh, and she's pretending like she's not so, trying to distract you, she just kind of turns around and her butt's wiggling at you with her red sparkles on there. And then he's pulling the rabbit and stuffing it into the hat or whatever, right? Or loading his sleeves with rags or whatever he's doing because she's misdirecting you. So there's a lot of tricks just in life. And thinking strategically is something that needs to be exercised like any other muscle. We cannot rely on media. We cannot rely on other people's opinions. We have to familiarize ourselves with history. We have to familiarize ourselves with just like how people think and what people actually say. We got to get this information straight from the horse's mouth a lot of times too. And we just need to be aware of people's motives and, and why they would be pressured to do certain things because there's a lot of misdirection happening in both directions. And what we see here unraveling What's the date here, Lou? Today November is... November 18th or something? The 20th. Yeah. So we're a couple, what, like just a little while after the 2016 presidential election, and we have huge contention. Like we got people burning stuff down. We got the other side just like cracking down. We got like a lot of heat coming from both sides. What I see here, man, is the word you said earlier. It's an engineered conflict. Conflicts like this are not natural, Okay. People naturally just coexisting in a prosperous country like this where everyone's very comfortable. Even the poor people, there's, dude, I'll tell you something. I never seen a poor person ever in the United States. I went to the worst reservations. I never seen a poor person in this country because you're not poor if you're fat. And if you got enough meth, you're not poor, okay? You might not have a nice house or a sparkly car, but there is no poor poverty people in the United States. You go to Africa, yeah, you'll see poor people. You go to like Asia, Central Asia, where you see some grandma frozen to the sidewalk who's a skeleton begging for food, that's a poor person. There ain't no poor people in the United States. We're all very fat, happy, and spoiled. And the poorest of us eats plenty well. There's no shortage of food. Even the train hobos and the bums got a beer belly on them so that I've never seen anyone starving to death in this country. I haven't seen it. And I know a lot of people who do the mission work and stuff and they go and feed the poor people in the inner cities. And that's great. I think that's good. We're supposed to be nice to the inner cities, but they're all already fat. You don't need to feed them more. They need to get a damn job. That's just my heartless, evil character coming out a little bit, just to make the point. So I, I, there's corrections. And likewise, we need to be familiar with history, right? That's not what a poor person is. That's our ignorant current media's perception of it. And they try to use forces like this to like convince people that they have a terrible situation when they maybe don't. And so there's a engineered conflict. People in countries as prosperous as the United States of America do not have a natural pressure to kill each other, burn stuff down, decide they're pissed and punch each other in the streets and just yell and chant and burn tires and burn cars. That ain't normal behavior. It's not productive behavior. Not for a country unless it's and we become so rich and so spoiled to where we're so bored. We're so rich, we don't have to scrounge for food all day. We got a lot of time on our hands. When you have this level of prosperity, there is a certain level of uh, degeneration that happens with the culture in general, where people are bored and they want to now reinforce their emotional egos, right? Okay, that's when you know you have a first world country. When you have so much time and so much prosperity, you're now worried about someone offending you. Or you're now, instead of someone trying to actually kill you and eat your food and like steal your family and sell them to slavery or something, right? Like happens all over the rest of the world. So when we have this level of prosperity, it's when we have this level of, we really magnify tiny stuff and amplify it, even if it doesn't even exist. And we will convince ourselves with absolute certainty that it is a terrible thing, a terrible situation. Things are amplified and conflicts are engineered. And technology and the media only accentuates that. Yes. I such, mean, it really creates and drives it, actually. Yes. Such as this left-right paradigm 
And that is kind of the crux of a lot of the conflict out there now that the media drives upon us is this supposed left-right paradigm, when in actuality... Yeah, Republicans versus Democrats, right? Each side is just the devil, right? Yeah. Depending on if you're the other side or not. And the whole thing is just interesting because... You cannot plot out the dynamic nature of human thought patterns and value systems on one dimensional scale, right and left. That's what people would do to grossly oversimplify a situation so that they can use it to leverage it against itself. It's called divide and conquer. If you oversimplify things, you can categorize people and label them as either left or right, green or red or blue or whatever you want to categorize them as. This is actually kind of a funny perspective, but people really love camaraderie. And that's like something that's just in our brains. Like we love like banding together with people yes, that are like Yes, that's very true. And that's, that does have biological value. We are very tribal by nature. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like you can't have camaraderie without hating somebody else. Somebody's got to be on the other end. That's an interesting observation. Yeah, so, and um, I think that's that's uh, comes from back in the day. You have different people want to preserve their values that made them survive, right? And in a tribal system, your tribe obviously helped you survive, so you want to preserve that. And when something foreign comes in that's different, and when I say foreign, I mean by something, a different thought pattern, different idea, or sometimes different countries, it makes people scared because they know that their system kept them alive and kept them happy and they're comfortable in their system. And it's a threat because it might not be compatible with their tribe, see? There's value to camaraderie and there's value to tribalism to a certain degree. So a certain degree of tribalism is totally fine. And it's fine to be proud of one's culture. Culture. I think that the black people are proud of their culture. The yellow people are proud of their culture. The white people are not allowed to currently be proud of their culture, but I think that all those things are fine to a certain level, right? As long as you're not demonizing the other side unjustly so to just like, but that's, that's the interesting thing is like, there are certain entities, if you look in history, and this is where some people um, don't see how it's possible that it could happen today. But there are certain powers in history that use people's differences against them. Now, people's differences are actually advantageous because diversity in thought and biology adds to the fitness of the overall species because when different stuff happens, different ideas will help in different ways. And so if uh, one idea really sucks and everyone has that one idea that sucks, everyone dies. But if you have 100 ideas... And 10% of them suck and 90% are okay. 90% of the people survive. So a diversity in ideas or biological fitness levels or different things is advantageous, right? But there are people who benefit from manipulating that. They're aware of those differences which were advantageous and they boomerang them to their advantage to create problems so that they can maybe engineer a conflict to where, okay, I want to steal that guy's stuff. And I want to steal that guy's stuff, but they're both stronger than me. And I'm just a little weasel. But maybe if I convince him to fight to total exhaustion, I can go over there at the club and whack them both on the head while they're both laying on the ground exhausted from trying to fight each other, right? And then I take everything for myself. That's the caveman example. But it has happened for a long time and multiple levels in history. I mean, you can read Julius Caesar's writings. He did that like for a hobby, like... You just get on one side and you get them to fight the other side. Kings and queens in the Holy Roman Empire after that have done that. They had made deals in history like, okay, they're cousins. And like, all right, cousin, I'm in this city over here. You're in this city over here. I'll make a deal. Let's have a war. There's a lot of conflict generated synthesis that is used to create new outcomes. Because if there's something that is standing in your path, you have to burn it down to get what you want. And so that's what these powers do. And people are, might be thinking, well, this sounds conspiratorial. Well, yes, that's why the word conspiracy exists, is because people conspire. Some people do conspire. There are bad people who are smart. There's a lot of bad people who are dumb, and they don't conspire because they're not smart enough. They just walk around and be a criminal or burn stuff down. They're what they call what Saul Alinsky wrote in his writings, useful idiots. And they're often manipulated and used by the smart bad people to accomplish their goals because it's pretty easy to get dumb bad people to do dumb bad things. And the smart bad people are the ones that get all the gains to it. And this is something that's continuously happening all through history. It's nothing new. It's nothing that's crazy or uh, way out there in outer space. It's right down to earth. It's something that 
continuously happens. Even in the modern era, you can look at a lot of the wars that happened in the 20th century and uh, totally avoidable. And uh, there were certain uh, entities that gained huge amounts of money and power, the military industrial complex. General Eisenhower admitted it when he became president. He did a speech talking about some of the dangers of some of these different outfits that would gain huge amounts of power by getting everyone to fight each other all the time. So on national levels, a lot of these conflicts exist country versus country to gain synthesis on a global scale or to gain uh, maybe an advantage of a third country, a third party that started the fight, right? To uh, get in there and uh, gain access to a lot of the different resources that a country might have. So we can look at these examples in history and kind of get a general idea of what people are pulling, what strings are pulling in general. But as you said earlier, Rex, in a country as prosperous as this one, the United States, there is no reason for that. Everybody could sit around and be honky-dory, and we could have a slice of heaven on earth if we wanted. Yes. But instead... If you look at current conflicts, there are different ways that manipulators use it. There's a Hegelian dialectic process. Uh, There was a German philosopher by the name of Hegel. He was the guy that really kind of explained what uh, a system of manipulation and conflict that is used all throughout history. And the term is coined after his name, Hegelian dialectic process, which says that you influence people to have opposing viewpoints. And so you pit people against each other and then you get them to fight. And then out of the conflict, you create the synthesis that you engineered. And philosophers and governors, and if you read Machiavelli, they talk about how to accomplish this. They're not the nicest people at all times, some of these uh, people who do this stuff. They have something in mind. And wars are usually not fought for the reasons they say they're fought for. There's something else going on there. That's why I'm very much of a non-interventionist in a lot of ways. I I think that some wars are needed to have. I mean, if you need to defend yourself or if there's a truly bad thing out there, you need to go fight, then you got to go fight it. And that's fine. But a lot of times... Times, man. A lot of the reasons they put out for uh, being fought is not why they're actually being conducted. You know what I'm saying? It's that misdirection. Yeah, it's misdirection. Yep. You have to have the moral high ground. You have to create an excuse. So there always has to be an excuse. If you're going to pit two sides against each other, you got to come up with something legitimate enough that conjures up enough emotion. You've got to take the people's histories. So let's say, for example, I want Iran and Iraq to just fight each other for years and years and years because I don't want them to become an oppositional force and unite against maybe my interests, right? What are you going to do? So you got to take in the local demographics and figure out what excuses could we use to have these guys kill each other forever, right? And okay, well, these guys, religion, that's a good one because the Shia and the Sunnis kind of don't like each other, man. It's like the Protestants and the Catholics, except way worse. You know what I mean? Well, maybe Protestants and the Catholics 500 years ago, okay? (laughs) They went through that whole deal too. Uh, So we can look at that, and that's a good way you can engineer conflict is that's a good excuse to get people to shoot each other with army tanks and artillery and bombers and stuff, right? So religion, you go into Africa, there's a lot of religious fighting. And uh, who is engineering these, these fights? Sometimes they are organic. There are legitimate huge differences. That's the raw feel is the organic natural conflict within these people who want to fight each other because they sincerely are frustrated with the thing that's different than them and they really don't like it so they really do fight but who tricked them into fighting in the first place and who reminded them that that problem was there because like you said it's more advantageous just for people to coexist why don't they well people trick them into fighting sometimes the fight happens organically but usually there's someone who has something to gain there and they will often fan the flames or add a catalyst into a situation will accelerate the reaction process and cause it to burn a lot hotter and here in the west especially after this presidential election you can see where the lines are drawn and you can the country was split in half over this election and it still is you talk to yeah. anybody and trump supporters are still very validated and the hillary supporters are still very boohooing and there's no middle ground And if you remember from the last podcast before the election that we did, my advice was whatever happens, even if my side does not win, I choose to engage in peace mode. The reason I said that is because I'm aware of this conflict synthesis that that occurs. And I've anticipated this for a long time, like even a couple of years out. Like, so here's the general context of the current situation. Just if people want an example currently in this country, which is probably smart because we're about to get drawn into one of these situations right now. We're actually already kind of halfway down that path. So with all that behind us and all that being said, Mr. X, if anybody does want to unplug and look at reality, 
what might be reality anyway. What are the things to watch out for? What is the engineered conflict that's going on behind the scenes? The engineered conflict of our day, I think, is flapping right on our face. If you turn on CNN News, there's two sides, right? There's the left and the right wanting to kill each other. And it's divided racially. Other countries have divided themselves along lines of religion and things like that. And to some degree, it is that way now. But primarily, it's racially. America is a melting pot. And there's so many different colors of people from different places. And we have such prosperity. And we're so tolerant of each other in so many respects that the only effective means they've determined that really work good is different colors of people. And so that's a very effective means to divide and conquer the United States is to convince the different colors that all Although they're the same culture, they're the same religion in most cases, or a similar religion, Abrahamic religion, right? They're way more in common than they have differences. They all value barbecues and having grocery stores and having nice roads and a picnic table in the backyard. We all value the same basic things. But if you want to convince people they need to kill each other, you dig up the color situation because it's the most obvious evidence of difference. You know what I'm saying? It's the easiest. Yeah, it's the easiest one to recognize just on the surface. And so they dig up the historical context based on, you know, the the slavery situation that happened. And there's slavery universally throughout the world, as we discussed in other podcasts. So it's not unique to just one color or different colors. There's been white slaves, black slaves, yellow slaves, brown slaves, all different kinds of slaves throughout history. And different countries always abuse each other. Different people and cultures and tribes always abuse each other. It's a normal part of life. But it has been conjured up again for this cataclysm that we're about to undergo. So the current conflict that is being engineered is they've convinced the country that there is the right versus the left. And so by creating a one-dimensional political spectrum, they've convinced that there's only two choices. And therefore, that there's only two choices, you have to pick a side. And if you pick a side, oh, the other side is against you because it's on the opposite side because there's only the one dimension, left and right, and basically you have to fight. It's that classic Hegelian dialectic. Yes. It's and at work they've right they grossly there. oversimplified the political spectrum to do that, though, because back in the day, there wasn't two parties. It was just dudes who were like, it was businessmen running the country back in the founding fathers days, or like just guys who are like, yeah, I'm a public servant. So they would try to do it. And then they made parties, which was kind of a big degeneration, in my opinion, for the deal. Because once you have a party, it's almost like establishing an official religious tradition. Like, whoa, you subscribe onto a lot of stuff maybe you don't agree with, because then you only have a couple choices at that point. If you look at the current divide on the one-dimensional political spectrum, spectrum. They say it's Democrats and Republicans, right? And now the Democrats are pissed because the Republicans got it. And when Obama was in, the Republicans were pissed because the Democrats had it, see? And so you have this eternal conflict at all times. And then each side is continuously disappointed. And then when you get enough frustrative pressure, it will light. And you will see people throwing Molotov cocktails and burning stuff and shooting each other, right? So there's a diversity of frustrations that they've really amplified at this point. That different people have been disenfranchised in history and they're all mad, right? Like we're all mad, like, oh man, like the certain people are going to be mad about one thing that happened in history. The other side's going to be mad about what happened to their people in history and everyone's going to be grouchy with each other. So what they have to do is they have to concisely organize it into two main sides because you get a better fire that way, right? If you're going to create a war, if you have two big sides that kill each other rather than just everyone biting at each other's ankles, it's more of a spectacular train crash. The more cars you link up on the left and the more cars you link up on the right and then you get them to crash into each other, you got a way better train crash that way. And it's not just conflict with the political paradigm. It's also, as you alluded to earlier, the racial tensions. There's mm-hmm. uh, socioeconomic things that are at play here. Sure, sure. There's just- so they link up those things onto uh, one train or the other train. And that's your left-right paradigm. That's why that exists in such simple terms. Because you got to link them behind a common cause. And they convince them through media and being dumbed down in ignorance of history that, hey, you are this color, therefore you have to be on this side of the line. You are this color, therefore you have to be on this side of the line, or you're this religion, or you're this whatever. You have this view on this policy, therefore you have to be a Republican because you're this way, or you have to be a Democrat because you're this kind of person or whatever. So that's the whole trick though, see, is they've created these systems to really divide and conquer. And if they were 
to really reveal what's really going on dynamically with the political spectrum, it would diffuse so much of it because you can navigate your way around the train wreck. You could say, yeah, well, the train tracks right now on a one dimensional plane between left and right. Yeah, there's a train on the left and a train on the right. And if they move anywhere, they're going to crash right into each other because there's no way to go up and down. See, because it's train tracks. But in reality, if you look at a political spectrum, you got the X and Y axis, right? You have the left and the right on the X axis. And on the Y axis, you got authoritarianism and libertarianism. And those are two different schools of thought or two different styles of governance. Okay. So philosophically, you have left thought pattern and right thought pattern, right? And we all pretty much are familiar with those. That's what they tell us already. We already understand that. But what we don't understand is that there's a whole nother way of employing those ideals. You can either make everyone do exactly what you think, in which case left and right's a huge deal. On the authoritarian end of the spectrum, it matters big time because if I'm an authoritarian and I'm left wing, I will make everyone subscribe to my deals. If I'm authoritarian and I'm right wing, I'm going to make everyone on the other side subscribe to my deals. So now everyone's disenfranchised to the point of conflict because the other side's going to make them do a bunch of stuff they don't want to do, right? Mm -hmm. Because they are the authority. They are the government. They are the person in charge. On the libertarian end of the spectrum, that's where everyone is their own boss and there's not one person or side in control. Everyone governs themselves. Everyone's free. They have personal liberty to do whatever they want. You can be on the left and you can be on the right and you have totally different philosophical point of views, but you're not making the other side do what you want to do because you give them their own little castle. That's an end of the spectrum that we don't even see anymore. The Y-axis is the crux of the matter. And right now, both the Republicans and the Democrats are heavily weighted on the authoritarian end of the spectrum. That's the source of the conflict. So to make a long story short, what we have here is people engineering conflict by amplifying differences and authoritatively leveraging the other side to do what they want to do in such a fashion that will create enough pressure and heat to where it will ignite. Just like lighting a campfire. You get enough fuel on there, you get enough pressure on there and enough heat and it will light and burn stuff down. So they want to burn down everything so they can reestablish a different system over what exists now. Because what exists now is in the way. So they need to burn this down and get the new one in there. And so they create conflict. So with this whole conflict situation here, what is the game plan of the manipulators behind the scenes? So what we're seeing here is a manipulation of the mass media to create opposing viewpoints that didn't naturally exist to the degree that they are being shown to exist by the media. People are being taught by education systems and media and the general trend of pressure from every possible force that has influence that is controlled by the people doing the manipulation has been pushing everyone to focus on their differences rather than their common points. And so what we see here is the effects of that. So here's what's maybe going on with this current conflict situation. So for eight years, you have one president that continuously is disenfranchising the other side and making them feel like they don't have it right. And the education system gets in there and pokes them. So like guys who are like American cowboy, Western culture, conservative value, Republican guys, for eight years were worried that they're about to have the ultimate crackdown, civil war, FEMA camps, whole nine yards, government's going to come get you, got to join a militia so you can fight off the government. Oh my God, they're going to drone strike you soon, right? Remember this stuff, Lou? That's pretty hardcore. Yeah. I mean, like the civil war is right around the corner. Obama's going to get us. When Hillary gets in there, she's going to take all the guns. We'll be forced into a civil war. We'll all have to kill everybody. And it's going to be a terrible World War III situation, right? And then you see the emboldenment of the left side. Like, oh, man, they're really getting together. They're going to get us, right? And so now the great disappointment has happened. And the tables got shifted like Boom, inverted. Like, what the heck? How did that guy win? So the side that was kind of on the chase has been reversed. But you see, it's a trick because it creates the anger from the other side now, right? It's like, you chased us for eight years telling us you're going to kill us and drone strike us and trying to pass these laws and take away the country. What it's creating is a reaction. If you pull back on a rubber band and let go, what happens? It flies in the opposite direction really fast, right? So they've been pulling backwards on the rubber band for eight years, dude. Just like pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling. And then boom, either slipped out of their hands or they let go. I can't determine what happened at this point. If they slipped 
accidentally and the inevitable like yellow haired Trump force got in there or what the heck happened or if it was an on purpose deal if they decided. Now, I wonder maybe if there is a manipulator and I don't know for sure that there's necessarily one, but I kind of think there's one, the guy that owns all the news, the same guy that's funding all the strife on both sides. The same guy that funds the militias on the right side is the same guy that funds the radicals on the left side. Okay. Here he is. Yeah. Well, yeah. And they own the news too. He funds the national public radio, funds CNN, and the Fox News is through a different outlet. I mean, it's all the same forces, dude, funding both sides, fanning the flames on both sides of the conflict. It's trying to get the right so pissed after eight years of just having a foot on our neck and just like pushing the culture and everything authoritatively, like we said before with the authoritarian governance style, that's a problem with that is because like, okay, the people on the right don't want to act like people on the left because they have a different culture. So you can't make them, but we're all on the authoritarian end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So when the rubber band snaps, what's going to happen? The authoritarian powers are now transferred to their side and now they're going to use their authoritarian powers to boom, react against the left with massive authority. With all that momentum that's with been built up. all that built up power and anger and momentum. And I understand it, dude, because I'm right in the middle of that. And people who listen to this can probably halfway relate. Christians and gun owners feel like they've been in that situation. And so now what you see is a trick is you have these protesters who aren't even real. They're not even real protesters, man. They are being paid professionally. That got spilled in the WikiLeaks. They're being paid by the guy who owns the news. There's protesters even not so far where I live, and they're protesting for $17 an hour just down the road here where they're protesting over here, wherever we're at. And if you get paid to protest as a full-time job, that tells me that it's not an organic movement. It's being obviously facilitated by someone with enough money to pay billions of dollars, not only on media and mass media. It's a reality TV show. They have created a reality TV show that's going hot. It's going real because they pay for the revolution. They pay the protesters to do it and they own the news. So they own the cameras. It's all BS. It's not even true. It's a fake reality. But if you do it long enough and hard enough and convince the people on the right side that these bastards are now over here and man, they're protesting and they're throwing Molotov cocktails and they're actually, you know, some cops are getting shot and stuff now. So now the right's really mad. Like they want to crack down the, any excuse, like full bore authoritarian, like crazy unprecedented crackdown from the right is about to maybe happen. And that's how it's going to take off. That's what's going to trigger it. Because for those eight years, wouldn't have really worked to create the revolution because it's not the natural disposition of people on the right to be rebel forces. They have too much invested in their businesses. And they have too much invested in their property. It's kind of against the grain of the culture. They're very much loyal to most of your like uh, law and order type systems of operation. It's just the demographic is not correct to be a natural force that would react in such a way to a revolution idea. So for eight years, through all the stepping and poking and prodding, they never really took it to the streets, if you will. They just complained. And they sat there and they grumbled and they reloaded and shot targets and learned all this stuff, but they never got quite to the point of using it because it's a higher activation energy required to initiate the reaction on that side of people. And when they do react, it would be absolutely terrible because they're very well equipped, but it takes a lot more heat and pressure to really get them lit. You know what I mean? They're very, very bending over backwards. They don't really want to fight. They're not into that. What you see now is the tables have turned. So if you look historically speaking, and I guess that's why we studied the history, the revolutionary forces are often the poor demographic, the socially neglected demographic, if you will. That's their identity. As we we're talking earlier about people cleave to an identity of victimhood, right? Kind of as a hobby. So that's the demographic of the revolutionary on the other side. There's a lot of good people on the left who ain't burning anything down. But there's a small percentage, and I'm talking a very small percentage, like on the order of like less than a percent, that make enough of a racket on the news to make it appear as if the entire left is burning everything down now, see? Because there's a certain amount of people who will get paid to protest, and that's enough to trigger enough ones to come out of the woodworks. The ones who are disenfranchised socially, you know, through economic problems, whatever, in the inner cities, they have legitimate problems. 
things, man. Like they're pissed because their life sucks in the inner city. They, all their jobs are taken away. What are they going to do? Now, of course, they got crime and drug problems and like gangs in the inner cities. And maybe they weren't properly told by their education system owned by certain people and the news owned by certain people who did that to them. See, so now they're mad at the people who they're told to be mad at by the education and by the media. And the education in the media has gotten their crosshairs thoroughly adjusted onto the white privilege side of things. And the person who most perfectly represents that whole idea would be Donald J. Trump, right? Because he's a giant, successful white guy. So what a perfect guy to have represent that boogeyman that was constructed by the media for them. Perfect representation for conflict. Because that guy has a solid gold toilet. I mean, talk about just the optics of it. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying he's a bad guy or a good guy. I'm just saying it's the perfect engineering for having something happen. I ain't saying he's in on it, but people can always be used for it. So you have this pressure built up and they're legitimately mad on the left side because their life sucks. They've been told that that is the target, that all the white people want to hate them, that the Mexicans are all going to be deported. Gay people actually think they're going to get like thrown in camps. Did you see the reactions of the SJWs? It's pretty hardcore out there. Yeah, like I've even got some family who like is like really worried because they have friends who are gay and they think, oh my God, they're going to lock them up. I'm like, what? Where did this come from? I saw it on a meme or on a comedy show or the narrative. The narrative is being propelled by these people with huge piles of money who are bad people to project a false reality, exaggerating things to the ninth degree to get a fight going. So the moral of the story here, once again, is to not fall for that trick. Yes, the tables have been flipped now, hoping that the more natural revolutionary forces who are now fulfilling their roles and burning stuff down, in reality, we can see it, and that's what they play on the Fox News, see? So Fox News is controlling the right side of the paradigm misinformation campaign, and then you got the CNN and the other side portraying the other side of the misinformation campaign. So you have both sides adequately in real time being disenfranchised by the media and given plenty of fuel for the fire to fight each other, right? So all the angry white cowboys are watching the Fox News and they zoom in on the protests, which there are protests, and they're burning stuff down and shooting cops and doing whatever they do, Molotov cocktails, yelling F you, flipping off, yeah, white people suck. They find that person, they put them on the camera, see? And there are people that say that, but in their most of them being paid by the guys trying to start the fight, right? But it's a trick, dude. And then the other side watches their news and they zoom in on Donald Trump about what he said on a bus 11 years ago on a hidden camera about a woman or something. And so they're mad because they're getting their version of the story about how they're being mistreated and how they're going to get locked up in the camps and how they're going to like shoot all the black people and get rid of the Mexicans and the whole nine yards, right? So it's both fear, sides are... fear-mongering is what it is. Absolutely. Propaganda, fear-mongering, and just trying to divide and conquer. They've created a reality TV show that is not representative of reality. Just but, like but, the, the but real world on MTV. When they create the reality and we willingly subscribe to it every yep. day, then we fall for that trick. And here's, here's what I predict will happen. Here's actually what I think. And this is what I'm worried will happen. The natural forces now are the right side who had the foot on their neck for this many years is so mad that they are now going to make an emotional reaction now that they have the high ground. And, and the sides on the left are so scared because they know what just happened that they're like, oh, crap, we just lost control and we were about to throw these guys in the camps. Now they have the keys to the camps or whatever, right? Uh-oh. And so now it's a big fight and they both sides got everything on the line. You know what I mean? This is what I think is going to happen. The news will continue to show the protesters until someone finally gets mad and some white guy or some Ku Klux Klan hat wearing guy who's probably paid or an actor or some cop or something is going to do something stupid. And I think you'll have an event that will trigger more protests. The news will focus on that more. This conflict will go hot. And Mr. Trump being the law and order candidate that he is, he really pounded home like we are going to have law and order. What a perfect guy to have in that role for cracking down on a population that's all bent out of shape, right? So the conflict is perfectly in order. Know what I'm saying? So can you imagine if he starts actually locking up the protesters? 
which on a tactical scale, we're talking tactics versus strategy you need to do because that neighborhood's getting burned down and people are getting punched. You know, they're dragging white people out of the car and yelling at them, punching them on their cell phone cameras, punching them on camera. So stuff like that is getting just passed around on social media. And it happens. It's a big country. 300 million people in one pile. Eventually, like a few of them are going to do something really stupid, but that doesn't represent the overall people. Only like less than 1% of people on each side is doing that. You know what I mean? But they try to portray every group of people as a monolith and they try to There's group us like all together. There's only like six actual Ku Klux Klan guys, the rest are feds. There's only six like actual Black Panther guys and the rest are feds. So like it's really over amplified the level of tension. It's all in the news. And I get mad watching the news because I feel like my side is like righteous and their side is all terrible. And I want to like, if they had some kind of crackdown force, oh man, how tempting would that be? Oh, show them other guys, you know, but go see, get that, them. that's just the whole thing is that's that the we, trick. we all come at it from our side and our biases, but it's all an emotional reaction to the situation. And that's what we need to do is step back and exercise emotional intelligence yeah. and be able to deduce and inspect the situation yes. without our emotions coming to play. And because that, we've that's been the, trained to be very compulsive haven't we absolutely An emotional knee-jerk compulsive reaction and so the rubber band has been pulled back way far and now it's just been released so what i think is going to happen is the right will crack down on the left for what happened for the last eight years so hardcore that it will fan the flames of the revolution happening on the left side it'll amplify the problem and then the right will have to overcompensate to really crack down on that because they don't have a situation and that will further like the fire. I don't think actually it's going to be very good. I mean, maybe they'll make it out of there, but the only key to solving this problem is for the side in power with the power to exercise restraint. To turn the other cheek. That's actually the answer to this deal. You got to turn the other cheek. They're just throwing Molotov cocktails. They'll get tired. They'll go home and let the system play out for like a year or two. Let them show, hey, we're not here to get you. We don't want to lock you up. Exercise restraint. You know what I'm saying? Like, we just want prosperity. If that's truly the side of the right, it will pan out if it has time to pan out, right? But the trick is, through media manipulation, is to get the right to crack down on the left so that it can be made into a reality TV show. Because the left, whatever happens, if you have like one cop in one of these cities crack down, that will get all the airtime. And so they'll use any excuse to do it. So it doesn't matter what the real story is. If they have the footage, they can make it look any way they want. Know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's the trick. There needs to be absolute seamless restraint on the hands of the power holders at this time. And then we need to back away from an authoritarian governance style back into allowing people that personal liberty so that the people on the left can do what they want to do with their lives. And the people on the right can do what they want to do with their lives. And then after everyone is free to do what they want to do, the left and the right will totally intermingle and get along and they'll merge. And it'll be one big, happy American family where no one bosses anyone around and everyone gets along. Like, oh, what are you? Oh, I like this. Oh, that's interesting. I don't like that. I like this. Oh, cool. Well, being that we're not making each other do it, let's get along. Want to come over for a barbecue? At the end of the day, humans have a lot more in common than we do apart from each yeah. other. The long-term correction on this deal is just an entire shifting of governance away from authoritarianism towards libertarianism and then just reminding each other of our common points. Do I think that's going to happen? I don't think so. I think, it's, I think we have to learn the hard way. But I would hope that just if anyone's listening, do not fall for the trick and go running after the bunny rabbit, Okay. They've engineered the bunny rabbit to run away from the dog. They know that we're going to chase the bunny rabbit, right? Oh, we got him. Now we got him. Now it's our turn to show him, you know? And the bunny rabbit's going to run, and there's like a big net in the tree, and it's going to fall and land on us and catch us all. See? It's a trick, man. Like you said a long time ago, though, in a country as prosperous as this, there's no reason to have that kind of conflict. So Yeah, there's not any actual natural conflict. There isn't any. We create it all ourselves. And yeah, we we're bought, doing and we just bought. fine in the 90s. We're doing just fine in the 2000s. I've seen it. I mean, there's always people who have social problems, racial differences, religious differences, but it wasn't like killing each other in stuff mode. You know what I mean? This is like the 60s again. 
I think that they tried to do it back then too, and it didn't quite go full yield. But uh, I think that with all the pressure, they finally got enough fuel on the fire. And with the absolute manipulation of social media, they've mastered the art of propaganda so well and the employment of it through social media to where it's way more effective now. And you're seeing normal people get kind of radical now. You know, it's like, what the heck's up with that deal? But like you said, man, we're all the same. What's the deal? We're all Americans. We're all green, baby, as they say in the army or something, you know, like you put on the uniform and you're all the same color. So I just don't understand the whole deal, man. Well, I do understand it, but it's just such a shame. We'll put it like that. It is a shame. And it's not too late, though, I believe. I think we can still stop this fire if everybody will just take a moment and put their emotions in check Mm -hmm. and realize that there's bigger things at work here, folks, and that it's a process is what it is. And we are part of the process. And we've only got a short time here on this earth. And while we're here, let's just try not to be shitty to each other. Right. This whole emotional attachment, virtue signaling, all this reminds me of an old George Carlin bit. He's talking about why he didn't vote because he's got zero emotional attachment to the political systems because... To paraphrase the legend in real poor fashion here, he said that when you're born unto this earth, you become part of the freak show. And when you're born in the United States, you get a first row seat to it. (laughs) And he just talked about sitting back and enjoying the show and not putting more fuel on the fire. And I think that's a lesson we can all try to take away from it is that there is some common good out there and that if you just let the negativity go, it'll take care of itself and yeah. there'll be some good stuff left over. If a person looks at um, what we just laid out and kind of what I think is going on with the current situation, history proves that that's not a good idea. Exactly. And just like Albert Pike wrote, all the game plans are out in the open, man. They've planned that stuff for a long time. Why do we have to follow the path? We can deviate from that destiny. We can. I mean, he wrote about it, right? We're right in the middle of that situation. We're right up to the point to where they would create such a conflict inside the countries that the revolutionaries would have to get cracked down on by the people who supposedly hold the Christian values, right? And they would crack down so hard that they would show that they really didn't have any mercy or compass to their direction of their morals because they're so emotionally charged up from getting exhausted and pissed at the revolutionary forces to where they crack down so hard without moral or compass, it would cancel out Christianity in the mm-hmm. eyes of the world and in the eyes of themselves. And the atheists and the nihilists and the revolutionary forces would cancel themselves out because they had also participated in the conflict. And so once those two sides burn each other down, then they have the synthesis, which is what they were talking about. And in the midst of that, they would also engineer wars on top of it. But socially, domestically speaking, that's what we need to watch out for. It's all been written down. And it's not been written down just by him, but you look at Brzezinski's writings, you look at all the major architects, the social architects, and even the people who own the social media networks, they're all participating in this game. And they all brag about it openly. So why do we have to give them the pleasure of jumping right into their rat's nest trap, dude? I say, eh, no, I'm going this way. And I'm with you. And that's why we're here on this show having this discussion to try to open people's minds a little bit, to try to have some ideas and to try Mm -hmm. to facilitate a little positivity rather than the opposite. Yep. And that's a very basic truth is that people attack and hate things that they don't understand. So the more that you have knowledge, the more you can combat hate. Yeah. And it gives a certain level of empathy too. a history professor once said in history, you see people make a lot of really terrible decisions, like the worst stuff imaginable. But there's not in a general sense, some people are just really, really bad. But in a general sense, you can look at most most people do things because at the time, from their perspective, whatever it is, they think it's the right thing to do. They think it's a great idea. And that brings us back to that long-term strategic thinking. Yes, we have to come outside our narrow time frame. We have to come outside our own emotion. We got to really step back, take a deep breath, and look at the vast field of like, okay, what really is going on? What's the perspective here? And I think that really... I mean, it lays out the entire battleground of like, okay, this is a dead end operation. If I add X, Y, and Z together, it never equals the solution of what I'm looking for. So why continue to go down the the wrong road every time? And we seem to follow that. 
I mean, we've had some things that we've evaded, I'm sure, in the past. There's been a lot of mercy shown unto us, maybe from above, on certain deals on that stuff. So it's not impossible. We don't necessarily have to fulfill that destiny if we don't want to. And if we do choose to fulfill it, then we kind of deserve the consequences and we'll have to learn the hard way. But at least for the people who pay attention and participate in this particular project, the Rex Reviews deal, you have a huge responsibility as being a person who is equipped to defend your values to first of all, define your values. And hopefully it's something good. Define them. Find something that you want to actually take care of. You know, you got to find that good stuff that holds you down, that keeps you anchored and remind yourself like, hey, if I screw this up, I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to lose my home. I'm going to lose all the good stuff in life. It just keeps us grounded. The positive keeps us grounded. And there's a huge responsibility not to employ offensive combat without really thinking it out. And I don't think there's ever really a time to employ offensive combat. I mean, everyone always has a right to defend themselves. So if there was a situation where you had to defend yourselves, if there was a crackdown or something like from a communist regime that infiltrated or whatever scenario you want to play out, yeah, that, you know, things like this happen. But in a situation such as right now today, we're in a unique position where it's almost like Even people who know that it's a trick still would participate in it because they're so emotionally charged and they're so angry at what has been going on that they feel like they need to do it. And I'm saying, don't fall for the trick. Don't do it, man. We just need to really step back, take a breath, turn the other cheek as much as humanly possible, give the other side every opportunity to just kind of like calm down, take their breaths. It's like the ankle biting dog that's your grandma's, you know what I mean? Like it's nipping at your ankle and you really just want to stomp on it. But it's like, hey, that dog has value to your grandma. That's, we need to have empathy. We don't understand why grandma loves the little ankle biting dog. But when we're not standing right there, that's the sweetest little puppy ever. And it's just her little baby. You know what I mean? Empathy. I I think that is the key word of this whole discussion here, Rex. And just because we don't understand why people find value to certain things. Like, I don't understand rap music at all. I don't understand it. I don't like it. It makes me grumpy. I don't understand it. But I do understand why I like the music I do. And I can imagine that if I grew up in a different context, in a different area, maybe different social thing, that maybe a certain kind of song would take me back to a certain time that reminded me of a certain thing. And I understand nostalgia of music. So, like, It's just empathy. Just because I don't like it and I don't understand it doesn't mean I have to come down on other people for certain things, you know? And I mean, certain like gangster rap, I don't know if it's like wholesome behavior, but neither is heavy metal. And I I do like heavy metal and that's not constructive either. (laughs) (laughs) Guilty pleasures. Yeah, so we got the God, we got the guns and the rock and roll in there. We had to put the music in there. I think you tied that all together very nicely. I hope so, dude. I just, but my sincere hope is that there's enough good people because I think there's going to be plenty of stupid ones that do all the wrong thing to get this thing rolling anyways. But I hope there's enough good people that to at least bear witness for what's really going on so that if we do make the wrong decision, we made an informed wrong decision so that at least we can learn from it at some point. Someone write this down because I think that it's a bad idea to maybe overreact. Maybe that's just me. Well said, sir. There's no period to put on this discussion. There is no end statement. There's no way to finish it out or make it clean. It's not clean. It's infinite. It's never going to end. History will continue to repeat itself. So I really can't say anything to bring it together. All I can say is that good has always won over evil in the history books, and hopefully it will continue to do so. I would say embrace the love embrace the truth, embrace empathy, and just remember that because somebody may or may not have some sort of conspiratorial plan doesn't mean that we have to fall into that self-fulfilling prophecy. Absolutely. And if people are looking for a cause to participate in, here's the thing, strategic thinking. There's more than two choices, guys. We don't have to pick the right or the left side. We can just pick, hey, I'm going to open the door for this sweet old lady when she's going to the grocery store. Like you sent that text the other day, right? Didn't, was that you who sent that, Casey? 
Yeah, she sent some a really good text the other day, like, whatever happens on this election deal, I hope that we can all still learn that we can open the door for each other. We can have kind conversations. We can all enjoy the same things. But honestly, and I don't want to sound like a hippie, but I think that there's certain times and places for that whole value set of just like, hey, calm down, man. Let's just take a deep breath. And strategically looking at the battlefield, both sides are going to lose. Neither side is going to be in the right when it all starts burning because both sides are authoritatively dictating to the other side what they want to do. And so there's only naturally going to be pressure out of that. So I don't see that either side is maybe worth fighting for on that deal. But I think that good values, universal good values, both sides can agree on those. Getting along, loving people, all the good Christian stuff we talk about in the Bible studies. I think that's all stuff that's worthy to cleave to in these rough times. So maybe engage in a whole different dimension. Let's just put it like that. The one thing with that text that I sent, the whole idea behind it was choosing humanity. You know, you don't have to pick a side. It doesn't really matter who wins. We're all human and uh, we all have human responsibilities and we all have human emotions. We all are people. So in the end game, it doesn't matter what you like or what you don't like or what you believe in or any of that. You have flesh and you have blood and that's what makes you human. And it's funny because I'm having this epigenetic relapse situation. Remember, we talked about this a couple podcasts ago about genetic memory. It's like, I feel like maybe Grandpa Tibor Shores Rex back in the castle days here. And I'm just sitting here and I'm like farming my little field outside the castle and uh, leading the donkey around on the leash to get some water and just kind of having a good time going. And then we we play the uh, uh, accordions or whatever the hell it is. No, what are those things? <laughs> and we go back to the, the, the cabin, you know, in nighttime, turn on the lanterns and just sit there and tell stories and, and play some music and have a beer or whatever we do back in the village days, back in the old country. And then all of a sudden into town rolls... These guys and one set of horses and the knights in the armor, they got the red uniforms on and the other side has the blue and they're all charged, you know, and they're like, all right, guys, you need to pick a side. Either got to be the blue guys killing the red guys or you got to be one of the red guys killing the blue guys. See, so like, all right, everyone sign up now. And I'm like, dude, or I can go over here. <laughs> <laughs> or we can just not play war. Yeah, I'm good. I'm just going over here. And they want to draft you into this fight. And I'm like, oh, what are you guys fighting for exactly? Those red guys did this to us. Oh, man, that sucks. Well, that's terrible. Why did you do that? These guys did this to us. And then you, you stand there for 10 hours and both side rattles off all the terrible things they did to each other. And you're like, you guys are both like a bunch of assholes. I don't yep. want to play with either of you. <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with any of you crappy yeah. people. You, you guys fight it out, man. You guys, it takes two to fight. That's what, that's what my grandpa always told my dad. Anytime there was a fight, both people in the fight would get in trouble. Like if my uncles were fighting when they're little, you know, ah, hey, who started it? Doesn't matter. It was a simple solution. He's like, yep, you're both in trouble. It takes two to fight. So why'd you fight? Why didn't one of you walk away from the fight? If one of you would have walked away from the fight, there wouldn't have been a fight. Amen. Now, if they chase you down and pin you to the floor and start punching, okay, you got to get them off you. Then you can punch them or whatever. But 90% of the time, you can walk away even from a really mean bully. I've learned that in life. I've walked away from way more bullies than I knocked out. You know what I mean? And if they get you, then you got to punch them. That's fine. But like normally, you can walk away from the fight before it starts. It takes two to fight, guys. So when the knights roll into town to make you want to sign up with the red army or the blue army, I just, you know, I might not be home that day. You know? <laughs> I just might. Yeah. Well, where's, uh, where's Rex? Oh, he's out in the woods. What's he doing out there? I, I think he's climbing up a tree looking for honey or bird's eggs or something. I don't know. He's hungry. I don't know. He's out playing the accordion out in the field out there smoking a pipe or whatever, you know, like, <laughs> oh, he's engaging in peace mode, huh? Okay. Yep. Well, that's yep. fine. I'm not going to get too riled up because history is just too full of worthy causes to kill everybody for. It's like, dude, it ain't that worthy if you got to blow up the whole country to accomplish your cause and everyone's got to die and get shot and stabbed and whiskey bottles smashed over your head. That's, I, I don't, I just don't understand, man. I don't understand either, Rex, but you know <laughs> what? You know what I do understand? Week by week, episode by episode, we flesh it out and we get a little bit closer to the truth here on the podcast. And, I hope so, man. And anybody out there who's still listening, who's still participating in this discussion and trying to learn alongside of us, we appreciate you and 
really hang in there. We will get to the end of it. I'm confident. Yep. And like I say, I think I don't know if it's all, all about exactly how the points come out in the end, but I think it's how you play the game. That's what really gets scored, in my opinion. You Absolutely. Know? Because like this whole thing is a test, man. There's going to be conflict. That's kind of normal. I mean, there's going to be conflict. Stuff ain't going to go the way we want it to. And I hope it goes a better way. But really, the test is in how we react to whatever's thrown on our lap. It's not what happens, but how you deal with what happens. We can't control the way this whole thing is going to roll one way or the other. So it's either going to go in a terrible way, which I kind of could see it happening, or it could go in a good way, which I would hope to see it happen. But whichever one of those deals happens... My universe is entirely within my control, and I can choose to either win my little battles or lose my little battles. I don't need to engage in other people's battles. I got plenty for my own self right now. I only control what's in my area of responsibility, which is my life. And so I'm not going to go and participate in conflicts that I don't even know what the heck's going on the whole way. And as much of a convincing argument as one side might have versus the other, it takes two to fight, and I'm just not going to fight, man. Unless they corner you, but then whatever. It's back to that peace mode. Let's just maintain peace mode. Peace and love, man. That's what it's all about. Those who carry the big sword would do best to just not use it because those who live by the sword die by the sword. And that comes straight from the man. Yes, sir. And that rings true. Doesn't matter if you're a good guy with the sword or a bad guy by the sword. If you live by the sword, if that's your answer to everything... That's the answer someone else is going to use on you, too, see? Yeah. That's just a fact of life. We reap what we sow, Mr. Rex, and we are, after all, in this together, all of us. So let's sow some peace, man. I like that. And then we can reap some peace and peace for a long time to come. Amen, brother. Sounds glorious. We're going to take a quick break here on the Rex Reviews podcast and be back with another portion of the show right after this. Oh, that's 